Thank you. How's everyone doing? OK, great. My name's Alex Schneps. I'm Events and Programming Manager of City Space. Thank you so much for being here tonight. If you like what you see, you can check out all of our events at wvur.org slash cityspace. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Share all of the amazing pictures that I know you are going to take tonight. Uh, and please come back and see us again soon. I'm really excited to welcome our guests on stage, so I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I'm just going to read these fantastic bios, which I will say, I did not, it, there is no edi editorializing here. I didn't write this. They wrote this themselves. So <laughs> here we go. Tom Fitzgerald and Lorenzo Marquez have been a couple for a couple of decades and married for half of one. In 2006, they took their backgrounds in film, music, fashion, and advertising and launched a gay-themed reality television blog called Project Run Gay. Yes, fans, good. Which brought them a level of attention and acclaim that might have turned them quite obnoxious, again, didn't editorialize, <laughs> had they not been so busy turning that initial outburst of interest into a long-term media and publishing plan. 12 years later, their eponymous website, Tom and Lorenzo, enjoys a readership in the millions, a podcast listened to by tens of thousands every week, a book, and a social media presence that has all combined to successfully recast them from fan bloggers to legitimate fashion and cultural critics. They are members of Galeka, the Society for LGBTQ Entertainment Critics, and Tomato Meter approved film and television critics for Rotten Tomatoes. And I'm very happy to say that we have Christella Guerra here tonight to moderate this conversation. <laughs> Christella is an arts and culture reporter for The Artery. She worked for nearly four years at the Boston Globe writing human interest features, covering everything from blizzards to arts to immigration, as well as breaking news around New England. She started her career in Florida, logging seven years at the news press, where she wrote about Cape, Cor Cape Coral City Hall, crime, education, LGBTQ issues, and business. She is driven to understand people's passions, committed to local communities, and hopes to use the arts as a lens to delve deeper into stories of equity, culture, social justice, and race. And so with that, I'd like to welcome our guests to the stage. Thank you very much. Beautiful people. I can't really see you under these lights now, but should I start? Please. Okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna launch right into it. Uh, oh my oh, wow. God. I didn't know you were doing that. Okay. Um, we have a lot to cover. And uh, Chrisella and we decided the best thing for me, for us to do was for me to start off with a short reading because um, it is going to encompass all the themes of the book in about eight minutes. Before I start, the book uh, takes Drag Race and uses it, uses the format of the show to dive into queer history and to um, highlight legendary figures in our cultural history, some of which are not well known. Um, so I'm gonna skip all the part in this chapter that talks, this is the chapter on the song and dance challenges that happen every season. And we took that and we related it to all of these legendary non-gender conforming singers over the years, over the last hundred years. I'm not as nervous as I sound. I'm like all breathless because I had like two cups of coffee. <laughs> um, and I'm excited. And let me tell I'm just going to launch into a bio of this one person that I want you all to meet. Um, and when we're done, you'll, I'll explain why I wanted you to meet this person. And I also want to let you know I've read this twice over the last two days, and I cried each time. <laughs> and it's not because I love my writing so much. I'm, I'm and I will try not to bring the room down. Yeah, we all cried. I'm really yeah. curious, though, how, how many people in here have actually read the, have read the book? Yes? Oh, good. And so we're going to open it up for questions fairly quickly. I'd love, you know, engagement, participation. I feel like there's a lot to discuss in terms of just queer history in general. Um, and so, you know. Prepare yourselves, get ready, and please, you know, engage with us in that way. We're doing some deep yeah. diving. It's true. Okay. I'm just going to do a, pull an introductory paragraph out and then launch into it. 
If there's a point to the song and dance challenges on Drag Race, aside from the obvious entertainment and competitive value, it's to demonstrate that yes, drag queens do sing, that some of them are quite good at it, and that virtually all of them are going to face a hard time trying to make their way in the music industry. Rue and Michelle both know this from experience, but the history of queer, drag, trans, and non-gender conforming musical artists backs it up nicely. Those trailblazers had it rough, so you better toughen up, buttercup. Gladys Bentley's Butch Blues. And if anybody would like to Google Gladys Bentley's picture while I am reading this to you, I urge you to do so. A king. <laughs> I don't want no man that I got to give my money to. Gladys Bentley singing Worried Blues, 1928. The past is often bolder and queerer than you think. Go back nearly a century and you'll find Gladys Bentley the blues-singing, piano-playing, black lesbian performing sensation of the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 1930s, wowing the audiences at Harlem's legendary gay speakeasies and nightclubs, such as Harry Hansberry's Clam House and the Ubangi Club, by performing in a top hat and tails while singing raunchy blues songs and openly flirting with the women in the audience. Born in Philadelphia, in 1907, she ran off to Harlem by her late teens, tired of clashing with her family over her masculine presentation and tendency to get crushes on women. At the height of her butch, piano-banging fame, she was often billed as a male impersonator. But in reality, she was simply a butch, queer black woman whose preference for male attire extended into her day-to-day -day life, as much as she could get away with, and who didn't try to do a thing to camouflage that fact. Given her presentation, it may even be correct to view her as transmasculine. Legendary Harlem Renaissance poet Langston Hughes wrote of her performances in his autobiography, describing her as a large, dark, masculine lady and a perfect piece of African sculpture, animated by her own rhythm. Her performances were characterized as large, bombastic, thundering, and as raunchy as it gets. They called her the brown bomber of sophisticated songs. In the 20s, sophisticated meant dirty. <laughs> and they were filthy. Look them up. They were oh filthy God. songs. Yes, the songs are hilarious. You'll be horrified in 2020. <laughs> no, I loved it. <laughs> this one about the brown spot on her dress. I won't even get into that one. Her charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent secured her a spot as one of the highest paid black entertainers for a time in the 1920s. The folks who came to Harlem nightclubs weren't naive about what Gladys's presentation and onstage behavior may have revealed about her personal life, but this was at the height of that queer cultural moment of the late 1920s and early 30s, the pansy craze, a period when audiences accepted and even sought out queer musical performers, happy to indulge in their talent and charisma so long as they didn't have to hear about the rest of it. Keep it on stage where it's fabulous or keep it to yourself where it's sinful. The 1920s and 30s were a time when the prohibition of alcohol gave rise to an entire underground nightlife scene in places like Harlem and Greenwich Village, where many of the rules of the outside world were suspended, and a woman like Gladys could receive huge accolades and wealth based on the power of her overtly queer persona. But the pansy craze, like so many of the brief flirtations LGBTQ folks made with mainstream acceptance, ended quickly and without much warning. When the Great Depression kicked in, a weary, stressed America turned to wholesome Hollywood entertainment to forget their woes and embraced a formalized sense of public morality as outlined in the newly adopted Hayes Code for motion pictures. The police crackdowns on the gender-bending drag reviews and pansy-hosted shows in the early 1940s sent a message that was loud and clear to queer performers like Gladys. Conform or get out. She left Harlem and eventually wound up playing in a lesbian nightclub called Mona's, where girls will be boys, in San Francisco for a time in the early 1940s. But eventually she had to give up her male drag if she wanted to continue to work. As the Depression gave, gave way to World War II, which eventually gave way to the highly conservative decade of the 1950s, Gladys wound up publishing an essay in the August 1952 issue of Ebony with the unfortunate title, I am a woman again. <laughs> uh, 
I'll get there. <laughs> Complete with pictures of Gladys in dresses and makeup, doing the dishes in her kitchen, and turning down the bed for her new husband before he comes home. What? The essay tells a tale of someone saved from a life of sin and perversion by the love of a good man and hormone treatments. It would be so easy from our present day perch to speak derisively of this turn of events or to cast them as a tragic example of someone whose fire and passion was beaten out of them by a society that had no room for nonconformity. But the life and choices of a black lesbian in the mid 20th century at the height of McCarthyism and with the threat of imprisonment or worse hanging over her? These things are not to be questioned by us. Gladys had to live and work in that world as a symbol of everything conformity hated most. A large black woman who didn't bend to gender roles. Gladys was, like many queer folks of her generation and several other generations, <laughs> at the mercy of the rapid shift in social mores that often happens when queer folks make some cultural progress, only to have conventionality and tradition slap them back. We can't imagine what forces came into play to result in the choices she made. It's not for us to say what would have been the correct or more fulfilling course for her life to take. For all we know, she was happy living in gender conformity later on. But the fire and passion and boldness of her youthful queer presentation and bodily sexy performance style could not be denied. She was an incandescent talent who burned bright, inspiring poets, and playing to ecstatic crowds as boldly and truthfully as she possibly could. Gladys Bentley died suddenly of pneumonia in 1960 after completing the training to become a minister in her church. Rue and the judges and coaches on Drag Race, knowing all that came before, all the brave and rebellious men and women who got up to sing in front of audiences in full defiance of the social mores and laws of the day simply don't want to hear that someone's too scared or too nervous to sing. Thank you. I don't want to bring the room down, and I want you to know, I've said this several times on this tour so far, I refuse to see Gladys or any of these people as tragic. Um, I see them as poignant, but I prefer that the book, f or, or that the conversation focuses more on the creativity and the fire and the boldness of her life, and of course address the forces that uh, forced her to go in the direction the, the direction her life went. But to me, Gladys was a king, and I celebrate her as a king, not as a victim. I get all choked up, not because I find her story sad, but because I find it so relevant to the experiences of queer people for the last hundred years, and especially, especially queer artists who put their queerness out there as their art. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Anybody else? No. I mean, we just started. I know. I know. We I know. Um, so, so we were talking, and, and you talked to the idea of... Uh, of, of why, of the fact that you thought that people would know who these people were. Generally speaking, even, I mean, what, queer journalists, uh, you know, the, the majority of the queer population, LGBTQ community in general, we would think, we would think that we know who our elders are, but we don't. No, I don't believe we do. So could you tell me why you thought it was important, both of you, why this book is important right now in 2020 to talk about? the last I, I, century of queerness. I think it's important for many reasons, and, and it w tying to the show, for example. I will start with that, and then you can continue. Um, one thing I noticed, and we noticed since the beginning of the show, especially in the beginning of the show, if you watch the show from the beginning, uh, RuPaul used to actually introduce these people, these legendary children, like a short paragraph about them, and then would go on with the challenge, with the goal, and anything. And that, ki that kind of disappeared, and then now they, they reference them 
uh, through jokes or, or a sentence or a line or something. And some people get it, but most people don't. And I n we notice that because I tend to watch shows and also follow my feed on Twitter, uh, you know, following social media. And I would see people laughing and find those things hysterical, but they had no idea that they came from Crystal Labasia, that they came from The Vine, that they came from Silva Rivera. You know, they didn't know. And, I w and m me as an older, uh, you know, queer man, um, I, 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 we felt a little frustrated about that. And we're like, no, no, they need to know. They need to know where they came from. It's very important. And then that's uh, how we talk Picking up on that, all of, yes, of course I agree with all of that. But um, picking up on that, one of the things we did want to get across in the book, or we didn't want to get across in the book, was this lecturing tone. Right. Like, we walked backwards uphill in the snow to get to Stonewall <laughs> in our day. Um, <laughs> Didn't want to do that, and so we tried. That's that's probably not the best example that passage, but we tried to keep things conversational, and either inspirational or poignant, but never, never, never lecturing in tone. And and also because we knew that it was going to have a broad. Uh, I mean, we hoped that it would have a broad uh, sort of readership. That it wouldn't. We had younger uh, Drag Race fans in mind. Uh, writing the book, but certainly it's it's a book for everyone. One of the things that we found is that a lot of mothers of queer kids are buying the book. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Which is yes. phenomenal, oh. phenomenal. And actually, it's good. F I, I hope I can't wait to hear from some of them who told us this, because there actually is a chapter or there is a profile of Jean Manford, who is the woman who founded P Flag, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, and uh, because there is a chapter about the queer family that's it that riffs off of Untucked. And how, and the history of queer people and their families, and how we create our own families, and so uh, we tried to make the book broad. But it is definitely the idea is, if you've ever been to DragCon, because the last time we went, I said to him, I was like, look at this crowd. This is who we're writing the book for, because it was all like these fifteen to twenty-two year old um, sort of broadly queer kids. And what I love about Gen Z, especially queer Gen Z, is the uh, the way that they, they, they just embrace a broad idea of queerness without necessarily declaring themselves. Um, and I know that's sometimes hard for queer people in my generation to understand, but actually I love it. I think it's great, and I think the book would be great for any kid who identifies as queer but isn't quite w sure where they sit on the, on the rainbow spectrum. Um, by offering an, as many examples as we could. Part of the reason I wanted to read Gladys is to make people understand, you guys understand immediately, it's not a book ab about white cisgender gay men putting on dresses. Um, there's plenty in there, Divine's in there, and, and Boy George is in there, and, but we wanted to highlight lesbian figures, and uh, oh, of course a lot of transgender women and transmasculine figures. We wanted to do, non-binary figures, bisexual. We wanted the whole LGBTQ to be as represented as possible, which is ironic because drag race is not that representational. Mm. Right, but we really wanted to fight that because if you look at the history of, of the queer community, I mean, all races and, and, and groups made it, made the community, so it wouldn't be fair to just have white people in the book. Uh, or just drag queens. Or just drag queens, that, that's just not us. And the other thing that we wanted to focus on the book also is we joke that the book, you should read the book with one hand and the other hand with you with should your be. Phone. We should That's be why I said look her up while I'm right. reading. You should be on your phone looking up these people or on the computer just looking you know, for pictures of them or when we talk about a video that, oh my God, you have to see this video and then go and check the video that we're talking about. Uh, and there's not a lot of stuff out there. So we but we did choose people. Right. The people we chose to highlight were people that you can Google right. uh, fairly easily and find things. There uh, obviously there's no video of uh, Gladys, but you do. There are her, her recordings are out there online, and you can listen to them for free. Uh, the back of the book has resources for where you can go find that sort of thing. Can you talk since we're we're on this specifically? At you know the names that people know and the names that people don't. I mean, I I knew of. Uh, Sylvia Rivera, I knew of those names, but I didn't know who Pudgy Roberts was. I didn't know who Alicia Brevard was. I didn't know who Jim Bailey was, who apparently had a killer Judy it's Garland. Killer thing. Judy Garland. Yes. You know, so what was... Jim Bailey performed as Judy Garland at the halftime show of the 1978 Super Bowl. What? How crazy yeah. is that? Yeah. What? How crazy is that? Google and it's that. online, <laughs> and she, she does the show with Vicki Lawrence and I think Minnie Pearl. Like... 
It's as campy as it gets. But I watched, I was like, it's the Super Bowl. What the hell is this? I want us to go back. Yeah, I, mean, I know. You know. Like, like you know, Shakira well, this, and Taylor were great, this but is, like, I want us to go back. Like, that's that's amazing. This is one of the themes of the book that we brought up in Gladys's portion, which is this waxing and waning of acceptance. And certainly the late 70s mm. was a time where queerness was, disco music and that sort of thing was accepted. And then, you know, the AIDS crisis hit and the 80s happened and then all that got pulled back. So how did you, I mean, main question, like many questions. Um, research, how did you do research and how did you choose what cultural reference points to, to use in the timeline as you also then related it back to the to drag race? How, how, how was that process? It was, first of all, we had to eliminate all the international, uh, um, let's say, references. Mm. Uh, not, all, not all of them, but most of them. Not all of them, most of them, because we just couldn't put all of them in the it book. It had to be American. It had to be American for now, and maybe we'll have a second book. Yes, buy a lot of this, yeah. and we will do Legendary <laughs> Children of the World next. I swear to you, I would pitch that in a second. We had to cut all the French drag queens, all the English yes. drag queens. Yes, Wanted yes, to talk yes. about Germany during, you know, uh, the people that got rounded up for the camps and all that. Oh couldn't do it. It was too far removed from right, the... Right the framing of the book, which if it didn't, if we couldn't relate it to Drag Race, yeah, yeah. Right. it kind of had to go. Yeah, yeah. It killed us when we, there's a, a chapter on the acting challenges that of course relates to drag in the theater and drag in cinema. And what we came to the realization was that the acting challenges on Drag Race, um, their, their um, roots are in underground theater and trash cinema, in other words, they're not doing uh, La Cage Off. They're not taking La Cage Off Fall as their reference points. Okay. They're taking John Waters and Divine. Okay. Um, I was going with this, and I can't. I was going somewhere with this, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> this is like the fifth time that's happened this week. <laughs> Just rambling about drag queens and then losing the train of thought. So, where did you go to find out this information? Uh, you want me to go? Yeah, go. Okay. Uh, help me if I start <laughs> rambling again. Um, uh, because of the nature of the uh, the framing of the show, uh, the book was Drag Race, and we wanted to keep everything related to Drag Race. Um, and because we knew we were, um, we had a young a readership in mind when we were uh, writing the book. We oh, and the third reason is we were on a killer deadline. I had, we had to do the entire book and all the research in four months because. Um, the first decade of RuPaul's Drag Race was in the proposed title, and we're in we're we're now 12 years or 11 years into <laughs> it. So I mean, this book couldn't be released in 2021. We had to get it out ASAP. Um, because of all of that, we kept all of our um, all of our references were restricted to people that we could uh, research online, because we knew that our reader the readers would research them online, and because we didn't have time to go to like the UCLA archives and look at Charles Pierce's drag gowns, which they have there. Um, we couldn't do things like that. So that was the main reason. It was time, convenience, and the nature of the audience. We knew that um, young people would look up who we were writing about. And if it was su if someone super, like you mentioned Alicia Brevard, mm -hmm. we slipped her in there. There is almost nothing about Alicia Brevard out there, but we did want to slip her in there as an example. Alicia Brevard was a female impersonator, a, a trans woman who started out as a female impersonator. Uh, she was a Marilyn impersonator in the 1950s and 1960s. She's got a really fascinating story. You can't find much on her. You can find a few pictures of her and uh, a few videos of her talking about her life, but you won't find any of her performance stuff. What did she take it, say about her two husbands? Yes, she, she had, okay, husband. I'll do a real brief rundown of Alicia <laughs> Brevard. She, um, she uh, left the farm in the late 1950s uh, and left her life as a boy, showed up at a legendary drag nightclub in San Francisco called Finocchio's that was, it ran, f it only closed down about 20 years ago um, and it was open for about 50 years. Uh, and they um, did legendary female impersonation reviews. And I say female impersonation because I, that specifically refers to drag queens who impersonate famous women. That's on the chat, that's the Snatch Game chapter, by the way. So Alicia comes up in the Snatch Game chapter. So she showed up at the doorstep of Finocchio's um, presenting as a woman in, in her ref, when she tell, told the story, presenting badly. She was off the farm, she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, the drag queens of Finocchio's took her in, did her up as Marilyn because uh, she was 
Alicia was six feet tall, but she look was. Her look her up. <laughs> yeah, look her up. Um, but she was even then like curvy, and if you ever see a video of her, just so daintily feminine in the way she presents herself. Um, that apparently they had good material to work with those drag queens, and she was she made for a killer Marilyn. Marilyn apparently showed up at her show. Um, Alicia could not get a doctor to help her with her transition, so she castrated herself to force him to do it. And this was not uncommon in the mid-century, and she talk, uh, you'll find video of her, she talks about it so matter-of-factly. She um, had a problem most of her life, like a lot of our elders, they talk about themselves differently than we would talk about right. them. And Alicia did not see herself as queer and did not see herself as trans for most of her life. She would say, I am a woman that was an appendage I just had to get rid of. Um, and she married three, she was a playboy bunny. She married three times, claims two of her husbands never knew she was trans. Uh, then she went to acting school. Uh, I think she got her master's and then she wound up becoming a professor uh, until she died about five years ago in her late 70s. Um, just one of those little fascinating people on the side. She never became famous. Uh, she's in a bunch of documentaries about, about that period. That's how we knew about her. But um, just one of those fascinating side stories that illustrates, you know, he here's an example of how trans right. women had to. I think that's the beauty of the book. And the, uh, I guess I was rambling. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the, the beauty of the book and the beauty of these people is that they, they went against everything that they could possibly come against them. And they still, they still wanted to be who they were. Uh, you, you, you see, and if, when you read the book, every, every, pretty much everybody um, just had to be what they, wa they, they were. Uh, and if they had to fight and if they had to go against everything, and you have to remember, at that time, it was pretty much illegal to do anything. All of, uh, all of it, it was illegal. Non-gender conforming presentation, right, right. you could get picked up and arrested for it. Um, flirting with a member of the same sex, I you mean, can get pissed. I mean, couldn't even put Dancing with on. a member of the same sex, right. you'd get arrested for all of that. Right, even if you put makeup on, or, yeah. or you dress like a woman, you could end up in jail. Right. When you think about it today, it sounds ridiculous, but that was the reality. Yep. And that was half a century ago. Yes, I mean, that was insane. It really wasn't that long ago. Yes. This was not long ago, and even today we 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 have a lot of work to do, I think. I yes. know. Yes, yeah. yes, we do. Um, so is there an, a legendary ch a child or an icon that you specifically, that spoke to you, that, that captured you, um, who, you know, mm -hmm. each of you, what, what story would you say? Because um, I, I really feel like focusing on the people. We pretty much love all the people. If they're on the front or back cover, we chose all the people. If they're on the front or the <laughs> back cover, yeah. Yeah. they were N. our favorite. We, we had the idea of having this, this type of cover. And Gladys is there. Yes, of course. And her uh, yeah. Yes. So and Gladys is my favorite. So we decided to choose those. Uh, we chose those because we felt that they represented the most. Um, but if I had to pick one, I would say Silva Rivera. Yeah. Uh, because Silva Rivera did something that nobody wanted to do, which was to include everyone that wasn't white. Um, and wasn't uh, some just gay. Yeah, she wasn't was gay. She fought for her white. trans siblings. Just, she fought for everybody. And, and she had to go against pretty much even people inside the community. And uh, there is a very famous uh, video. Uh, if it's you at Google the 1973 Christopher Street Parade, right. which is the precursor to New York's Pride Parade. And... Um, it is a really famous video, and I can't watch it without weeping. Um, she uh, waited all day to get up and speak, because at that time they were do Well, they still do speeches at Pride. Um, and, and they kept pushing her off and pushing her off. Speeches like that, though. What? There's a lot of commercial. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pride, in between, like, the that's Coors Light like commercials. Right, they I was going to say, like, <laughs> it, like in, in between the promotions uh, for the Right, like, right. Yeah, it's, it's different. But, um, of course, the only people that, uh, you know, Post Stonewall, and the book gets into this, Post Stonewall, the, um, here's what. Uh, because we get asked this all the time, what's something you learned that you didn't know before the book, you wrote this book? And this is something that we learned, but that really solidified for us, which is that pre-Stonewall, the L, the G, the B, the T, and the Q, we all huddled under one umbrella. B and we did so because we had no choice. Uh, uh, the mainstream saw no difference between a drag queen right. and a butch lesbian, between a trans woman and a gay man. We were all queers and perverts, and we were all forced into spaces. I always use this example. Who was at Stonewall? Drag queens, trans women, butch lesbians, gay men. Who was at the Compton Cafeteria riots, which were three years before in San Francisco? 
butch lesbians, trans women, drag queens, gay men. We, uh, you know, gay men socialized on their own, and le there were certainly lesbian places where people socialized on, you know. It's not that we were always together, but when it came time for us to fight back, or it, we did it as a family back then. Stonewall happened, and the segmenting started because uh, we, we became solidified as a political movement, and we started uh, pushing people up to leadership positions. And guess who we pushed into leadership positions? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Sylvia was fighting against this, I and I, I, not just Sylvia, but Marsha P. Johnson as well, right. was fighting against this idea that the newly resurgent queer movement was going to be all about white cis gay men and women. Um, so she stood up, she spent all day trying to get up to speak, they wouldn't let her speak, and uh, Sylvia had substance abuse issues, and she um, did sex work, and so she didn't present the way, you know, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't assimilative, the, which is what everybody wanted back then. So she gets up, finally, at the, nearly, nearly the end of the day, she's clearly kind of wasted, but she's furious and she tears into the crowd and she said, and partially what she tore into them about was that there were trans women languishing in jail and nobody cared. And they were writing to her all the time asking for help and she couldn't get anybody in the, in the community to care. And that was basically her point about, she was yelling at the crowd about, you know, you've got, we've got brothers and sisters in jail and none of you motherfuckers care and all that. I mean, it was raw. And then she gets to the end of the speech. This is when I break down. She just starts screaming. There's feedback on the mic and everything, screaming, gay power, gay power, over and over again, which in her instance, it was irony. Gay power was the battle cry back then, and she was sort of saying, you know, it was a fuck you to all of them. Like, gay power, fuck you. This is, it's just white gay male power, you know what I mean? And there's booze going on in the background, and she breaks down sobbing, and as she told the story later, she went home and slit her wrists, and Marsha P. Johnson found her. And that's, that's the basis of their sister. The whole first chapter is Marcia and Sylvia. Uh, and the reason Sylvia's tied in is we bring up the um, You've Got she -Mail controversy in Drag Race, where um, the gay community ran afoul of trans advocates, and they, the trans advocates had to get up and yell at them and say, this is not your word to claim. And that, you know, that's right. That's Sylvia's work being continued, so. Learns a why Sylvia yeah. for you. No, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, summarize it for me. But that, that's it, because she fought for, 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 for the part of the community that was represented. It had no voice at all. Uh, like, like Tom said, he went on she went on stage and, you know, and yelled at us, the other com part of the community that wasn't paying attention. Uh, and that went on for a long time. I mean, uh, for her whole life. She died yes. in 2001, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, one of the sad things, I didn't get into this, we didn't get into this in the book, but a lot of the people we cover, a lot of the trans women we cover, cover in the book are, were dead by 55 and the reason for that is um, they were a lot of them were doing um, street hormones and um, a lot of them wound up getting liver cancer from it so a lot of the trans women and, but we didn't mention that in because it was starting to get too far afield like go look we want people to look stuff up but that was one of the things that came up Sylvia died young Crystal LaBeja died young. Pepper LaBeja died young. Uh, I know that Netflix had a uh, had. Yeah, I don't know if they still have it. A very good documentary about Marsha P. Johnson mm -hmm. and Silver yeah. Rivera. It's it's a little controversial. Yes, it is. But but there's some good stuff in it. Yeah, and so they talk about Silver Rivera as well. So. Um, I mean, maybe we we've sort of answered this, but I I, I feel like knowing this is going to be a video, knowing people are going to be watching this, especially maybe people who haven't come out of the closet, maybe people who are questioning, um, why should we why should we know who our elders are? What in the next, in the next uh, iteration of what this queer community looks like? Why is it important for us to be aware? And, and you even make the point that we're getting to a point where, you know, what's heteronormativity, right? right? I mean, the next generation is really defining for itself what it means to come out of the closet, what it means to be, it's it's itself, right? Whatever right, form right, that right. takes, they, them, or otherwise. So what 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 do we see next? I'm going to read the final paragraph here of the book. It's kind of giving it away because the whole book leads up to it. But this answers your question. This is the approach that we took. This is the reason for the book. It's short, I promise. <laughs> if there's one thing we wanted to get across to you with this book, it's this. You stand in history, smack dab in the middle of it, 
You are not at the end of it, and you are not at the beginning of it. No one ever is. You exist on an ever-shifting spectrum of light that bends and changes and morphs underneath your feet. Yes, it's true. Legends once walked the earth. They still do. Maybe you're one of them. That's it. That's the book. That's the whole point. What would I say to young people? There are legends. You can be one. You can be one, too, if you want. Or you can just walk behind these legends and thank them for, you know, wearing a path down for you to walk. Right. That's I what I... I think knowing about your history, knowing about these people, number one, you, you understand that they went through a lot. And maybe just how much you're going through yourself. Uh, different time of history, different situation. But you kind of like, wow, these people went through so much just to be who they wanted to be. So maybe, you know, I can do the same. Or maybe I can understand myself better now because I know that what I'm going through sucks. Right. But, but I can get through it. Uh, because, because it sucked for them, too. It sucked for them, too. And, and the beauty about these people, in my opinion, is that they weren't trying to make history. They made history, you know, by accident. Inadvertently. Inadvertently. Yeah, yeah they, they just wanted to live. And their be life. their truest selves right. and push that out into the world and not tell anybody that they couldn't do that. But they also and were born into a time that, I mean, I, I think about what it was for, for me to come out, for us to come out. Right. And I, it's nothing even close to what other people went through. The, to, to, to the previous decades where you were put into an asylum because you happened to right. be attracted to the same sex, you know? Right, right. right. But I, I, I don't like to say, oh, we had it harder. Maybe we did, but it's still hard for a lot of people. Life's hard and for it's everybody, not my place e even now. now. Right, now. and it's not my place now to say, oh, boo-hoo, you know, what you're going through is, is not what I went through. I don't think it's fair because I think you're the one who, sh who has the capability of measuring what you go through. Right. You're also telling people, I think importantly, that our, that our movement was born of folks of color. And oh, uh, yes. Our movement of right. born of, of, of <coughs> right. folks of color who were fighting um, mostly a white supremacist culture that even embedded itself in LGBTQ. In LGBTQ culture. Community. Yeah. Um, uh, this is another sort of thing that I, we knew, but again, solidified in our research, was, which was that <sighs> pre-Stonewall, um, trans women and, to a certain extent, drag queens and femi gay men and butch lesbians. And I say femi and butch because they were all on the front lines of queerness because they could not pass. There was no coming out for these people. They lived, they were born out. There was no way for them to not be the queer people that they were, and there was no way for them to visually queer, you know, presented as queer in 1960 or whatever. Mm -hmm. They were on the front lines. They were the people that the police were harassing. They were the people that the boys were beating up. Um, the ones who look like us, we could go home to our respectable lives. And so we didn't fight uh, the way they had to fight, not in the early days. That's why the, uh, the movement, that's why our culture, that's why our community owes so very much to uh, the trans women and the people of color and the really super gay people that couldn't hide it. They were all on the front line way before any of us were. Questions? Ooh. Shall we start? I, I think Alex, oh, come uh, on. the mic. Right there. Hi. Hi. Hey. Welcome to Oprah. Um, oh, oh, you have to hold it. <laughs> oh, can you have to use coronavirus. <laughs> what? Sorry. You don't have people safe. Um, you don't have gifts. S if so, Oprah, you um, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's under. Yeah, your there's seat. there's cars under the seat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we're um, especially in the Boston area. There were a lot of queer spaces, queer bars, yes, queer clubs, mm -hmm. and now there's a reduction. Oh yeah. There's sort of that notion of assimilating into normalcy, right. and not having that space. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, in the same way that you're targeting this book to younger queer people, w how do you talk to the still the need to have these sort of underground places and safer places? And uh, I miss our dirty little no, uh, and actually, <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the paragraph before the one that I just read that's at the end of the book, we make this point where, where we, we even identify ourselves as cisgender white gay men 
who are married and we say, look, we're about as mainstream as our community gets and we are, would never advocate that our lives are the ones that the community should be modeled on. We as a community must always, no matter how much equality and tolerance we manage to accomplish, uh, we must always give space to the freaks and the envelope pushers and the weirdos and the people that make us uncomfortable um, because they did create our culture. Everything you see on Drag Race was created by freaks and outcasts. Um, and I feel that as we move towards this moment, this, this moment of equality, and even though it frickin' doesn't feel like it now, but we are more equal than we've ever been at any time in history. But even so, I feel like we need to make sure there's a sort of comforting space for the people in our community to be as weird, as femme, or as butch, or whatever, as crazy, as artistic, uh, as they can be. And to your question, yes, that spaces are a big part of that. And we do get, in, in the Marsha and Sylvia, the Marsha and Sylvia chapter is based around the workroom uh, uh, in Drag Race. And it's on this, uh, based on this idea that um, queer people do need spaces to congregate, to fight, and to literally do the work of being a queer person out in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Sylvia um, Rivera, she started uh, a, grou a group called the um, STAR, the Street Transvestites Action Revolutionaries, mm -hmm. because uh, transgender wasn't a word used much at that time. And um, she would provide, first she and Marsha would uh, use the money that they made turning tricks to, uh, they got a trailer for uh, their trans, what they used, they, they called them street queens, but they were trans women who were sex workers. Uh, where they could congregate and hide out if the cops were patrolling the neighborhood or whatever like that. The cops towed the trailer with 22 people inside it. They didn't even try and clear them out. When that happened, uh, Sylvia and Marcia stepped up their game and eventually got them a, a house. They didn't own it, they rented it, but I mean, they must have had to turn a lot of tricks to do that. Mm. Um, but it was so important to them that their people their siblings, their sisters and their trans brothers had a space because no one else was going to give it to them. Um, so yes, I don't know how to tell people this, all uh, young people this, all I can tell is them is that this is, was a tradition in our community and that it was important. I think young queer people are going to define their own spaces and they're not going to look like our spaces and I'm very welcoming to that. Um, yes. Right, we do we do talk a lot about that. Like we miss the gayberhood, you know. Who doesn't our age? Um, but I'm willing to give that up, you know, for a better world. If we can all live freely among the, you know, right. wherever we want, instead of being in just a neighborhood dotted with rainbow flags, I mean that is progress. But uh, Philadelphia had a gayberhood, and it's not really existent anymore. And every time we walk through, we used to live there. And every time we walk through it, I'm like, God, I remember being young and cute and sashaying down these streets. And half the people I slept with were on one side, and the half the people that I wanted to sleep with were on the other. And it, it was so buzzy, and there was rainbow flags. It was the 90s. But um, it's not there anymore. And I, I do kind of feel bad for young queer folks that they don't, you, you don't know what it, that, I mean, that sense of freedom to be young and cute and in a skimpy little outfit at high summer and I mean, walking amongst your people. I mean, I think, you know, gentrification's a thing. You know, we've right. lost our spaces because it's really expensive. Yep. And because our spaces, honestly, I think queer folks create beautiful spaces that then get taken away, you right, know? Right, right, like right. People move in, Apple stores open, you know? Right. And like, <laughs> the places we knew in some ways we're also considered like undesirable where the artists go, where the queer folk go, and then they have to move. And so that's also, I mean, a gentrification, housing, you know, yep. it was more that I think. And, and we see all of our spaces closing down. The oldest, uh, there was a, there was a many clubs in DC that closed recently. There were stories about in LA, oh in really? San Francisco. Yeah, it's, it's a trend, yeah. it's a trend. And, and in, so there's, I think a question being asked of where do we go now? Because it's not that we're all just getting married and being heteronormative. No, that is no, not no, no. either, I don't think. I hope not. You know, I don't think that, that that's all it is. I think that it's being recreated, perhaps, yeah. to a point. I, d I wouldn't. I'm very much of the opinion, and maybe this isn't the right answer, but I, I'm because of, I spent we spent a year and a half thinking about young queer people and trying to talk to them. 
Uh, and I did change my opinion, of my own thinking as a middle-aged gay man about how we talk about queer people and how we look at uh, young queer people. And I really came to a, a realization, that I don't care what y'all do, you're free, do it. Call yourselves what you call yourselves, live where you want to live. All I can do is tell you our history, tell you why it's important, I mean, like a parent, and then set you free. <laughs> um, to make a I'm not magic. worried about our young queer people. I w there was a time when I was, probably about f five to ten years ago, remember when it was all millennial guys saying, I don't identify as gay, and you know, I, that sort of thing. It does, labels don't matter and that sort of thing, but they were, you know, it, and it felt like they were rejecting their own, they, they, it was all about mask for mask and straight acting and all that, and I know that's very prevalent in the community still. But in, uh, in the last few years, um, I don't know, I see young queer people and it's, you know, gender queer guys, you know, half this and half that and they've got, you know, some makeup on but then they're in a, I love that stuff. I love little gender queer girl. I love little gender queer people and I'm like, I don't know, I can't tell and I love that. <laughs> I love that. I don't know what's going on here but it's <laughs> as queer as can be. It's sending off sparkles and rainbows and I love it. Um, so... I, I mean, we can. I can sit here as a fifty-something-year-old gay man and say, <laughs> you know, well, this is what young people should do. But I know damn well when I was their age, if some fifty-year-old queen was telling me what he <laughs> wanted me to do, I'd be like, yeah, all right, Grandpa. <laughs> so um, I'm not. Where I'm really. I think our young queer people are. I'm so excited about where they're going to go next. I really, really am. Um, they're just going to do it differently than we did. And when I hear especially white um, gay men of my generation tend to really get head up about right. that sort of thing. They the don't like the LGBTQ acronym. And I don't mean all of us, of course, but it's something sort of endemic in Gen X and, and baby boomer gay men. And when I hear that stuff, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't agree with you guys at all. This is why we marched. Right. Yeah. This is why we screamed in the streets so that some freaking 13 year old in 2020 can just go to his parents and say, I don't think I'm a boy, um, and, and not have their life fall apart. Um, and their parents can say, you know what, you take your time and figure it out. And they can say that because for 50 years we screamed in the streets about our pain and our journeys. I mean, I hope we're still screaming in the streets. I hope we never stop screaming. I hope those young kids never stop screaming. I, I think, think that they will. That, I that's think what I will. was going to say. Yeah. Uh, that. Um, what I expect from them, the young uh, queer folks, is that they learn their history so they can understand one important thing is that we open doors and then we have those doors closed. Yes. Uh, yes. And they, they keep open, we keep pushing them open again and then they keep closing them, you know, with a new administration and with a new president and with a new something. You know, we achieve something and then we lose something. So I just hope that they remember that and they keep forcing the store nonstop. Yeah. For them, for their, generation after them and, and, uh, and so on. We have about 10 minutes to get all the questions. Yes, Claude. We only answered one question, <laughs> jeez. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I have a comment and then a question. Um, one, like you were saying at the beginning, there are so many names and characters and figures in our history that we don't know, and I, I say this as a gay, white, cis man, we don't know because they don't teach this to us. Right. So thank you for writing this queer history. Thank you. You are quite welcome. So <laughs> first, yes, thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, I also, I mean, from a personal um, viewpoint, I've only recently really come to terms with my white privilege, and especially in the gay community. I've only discovered recently, all right, hey, better late than never, Cheers. that, hey, these gay spaces I love to go that are also disappearing, most of them, most of the people there look like me. Right. And they're the same guys who love drag race, love rooting right. for the girls. They love supporting these queens that are quite diverse, although not as diverse as they perhaps could be. Um, how do you see, I mean, this lifting up of a drag race center, I'm glad that you include non-cis white men in the story, but how do you take these white gay men who support drag queens and women of color when they're on a runway stage lip syncing and reminding them they're people who have rights that they don't have. How? Uh, I mean, I wrote a book. <laughs> um, but this, it's interesting, that is kind of an interesting question because and this sometimes comes up and we, and the answer is always, I'm not the one that's going to answer that question. 
the drag queens are. Uh, it's not that I don't want to stand with them and fight for them, but um, I can stand here and talk about how they're really people until they're blue in the face, until I'm blue in the face. But it take remember the vixen on Drag Race? Um, it takes someone like that to stand up and really get angry and force the conversation into that direction. Um, and I don't, I think if, Vic, if the vixen were sitting right here, she would say, yeah, but I didn't succeed. They're still all racist in that community and blah, blah, blah. But um, again, hey, the vixen's doing the work, doing the Sylvia and Marsha work of confronting the community and, and trying to force them into s recognizing the, their siblings in the community that don't look like them. I think we're trending towards that. I honestly do. The men that you were talking about, I completely recognize those men, and they're the last holdouts. And you were let's face it, you're talking mostly about middle to upper middle class white men, right? So um, I'm part of this group. I, I completely recognize my privilege and my membership in this group, but I also recognize that it's very hard to get people in that group to give up any, uh, to feel like they can let go of any of their privilege. Or, or to let someone else have a little helping of privilege. It's very hard to get people to do that because they feel like they're, you're taking something away from them. It's why um, the, a lot of gay men in, in my generation and the generation older than us have such a problem with that LGBTQ acronym mm -hmm. because they'll say, well, I marched in the street for gay power. Well, yeah, that was kind of the problem. But they, it's, I don't know how to, I wish I knew. I mean, if I, I could give you an answer, I think I would solve so many problems in the queer community right now. <laughs> But um, all we can do is keep having the conversation and stepping out of the way when someone like the Vixen takes over. Just stepping out of the way and letting, if anybody else in that group wants to speak for themselves, shut, we all should shut up and listen. That's my only No, I agree. Advice. I think the Vixen example is brilliant because, uh, let's face it, and it's hard to say this, but the drag race community can be racist. Uh, the fans of the show can be very racist. If you go online on social media, you'll be horrified with some of the uh, comments they make. And I think Vixen was a good time to question that and, and to have a conversation about that. Why is Vixen angry? Is she angry because she's a black person? You know, how, uh, like s how so many comments mention online? Or because she has something to say and she's going through a lot uh, as, as, as a minority? Um, so... That's the kind of conversation that I think we can have. And so we take something horrible and then, you know, change that into something more positive, more yeah. constructive. Anybody else? Oh. Yeah, as far as um, spaces and the concern about that, had you considered or thought about the children of queer people? So, of course, my mother is lesbian, parents got divorced gender fluid queer person, she doesn't quite get me. But now these spaces, whether it's more appropriate, which it is, are becoming better for, they call them unicorn children now, really right. book on that. So kind of your thoughts on that. And then secondly, um, where does the drag king community fall in a lot of this? So there's a lot of you know born female characters that you write about, and it just hasn't gotten the same traction. Do you think it's due to fragile masculinity or you That's know, a really good Why is this not theory. represented, right? So when I watch Drag Race, I think, hmm, drag is about women, but it's still about men. That's how I feel a lot of times. The Drag Race version of it, that's yes. very, very well, that's true. Thing. Yes. Um, we do highlight a couple. Well, Gladys is, is considered a drag king, and Stormy DeLavier, who was at Stonewall, we do a s short profile of her. Um, and there's a... Uh, a pro there's a paragraph in, in the final chapter that mentions, that says drag queens and drag kings were at the front line fighting the battle, as, well, as I said earlier, fighting the battles before any of us. But you are correct that they are, drag kings are completely marginalized in the drag community. Um, the only, this is gonna sound like a criticism of drag kings and that's, that's not how I mean it, but drag queens are, um, performing this incredibly ramped up performative form of me uh, femininity tropes. And uh, I always find, I mean, there's all different kinds of drag kings out there, but um, there's such a sarcasm underlying drag kings. Uh, there's such a knowing sort of wink at masculinity and how it's performed. And uh, drag queens, it doesn't quite have that sarcasm underneath it. If anything, it's sort of, elevates those femininity tropes. It sort of exalts them. Whereas uh, 
most of the drag kings I've seen, there's sort of a winking nod to I'm performing masculinity or isn't masculinity. Look at how it can be. Look at how I, it's a thing I can put on and take off. Um, there's a lot of subtlety in being a drag king, and there's not a lot of subtlety in most drag queens, uh, and that's, I think, where the art forms differ. Um, I have been advocating for a while, especially since we finished this book, that Drag Race really does need to start casting drag kings and bio queens. It really, it's not going to last. It has a young viewership, and they're already questioning why, why is this all cis men? Why aren't there trans women? Why aren't there drag kings? Why aren't there bio queens? Um, but that's the problem with Drag Race is it has set itself up as the definition of drag. Well, that's the problem with the show. I mean, we were very, very excited when we had that type of show on television. We had never seen it before. I remember watching season one with you, and we couldn't believe that we were seeing drag queens on TV like that. Uh, we had seen drag queens many, many times, but in bars and, and clubs and things like that, but not on, on, on TV. So that was great. And then it took off, and then it was like, all right, well, we go from here. And, and it didn't go anywhere. It didn't go anywhere. And it, it locked it, into and place. And it made it worse because it gave an idea that that's what drag race is about. Mm -hmm. That's all drag race. And it you is mean all drag? All drag, I'm sorry. Yeah. Th that's what all drag is. And it isn't. It's one fraction of the drag world out there. And that's the a major problem that the show has. Um, as to your question about unicorn children, uh, the book doesn't address any of that. It doesn't address unicorn children. We're, I, I don't, don't, I don't, again, there are, we have to recognize, and this might be a disappointing answer, but uh, Lorenzo and I are not historians, and the last thing we want to be are spokespeople. Um, and this is in the book. We're very clear about who we are and, and how we see ourselves. And there are certain things that I'm just, uh, I, I just feel like I can't speak to that because people who are in that world should speak to that. Parents and unicorn children, I don't have any children, and my parents were as cis and het as they get. <laughs> um, so it's not a world that I have, I, I truly don't have a lot of experience with it, and if I were to write about it, I would be spewing my white cis privilege all over it, and w that's, that's not what we don't want. We want to elevate the voices of the people, those people, not don't ask the, the white guy. I know I'm sitting here with the mic and I'm on the stage and I, I'm, that is privilege that puts me here. I completely recognize that. But I also realize that I've certain questions I need to step back from. Otherwise I'm just gonna ramble and, well I'm already rambling, but <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll be blunt, I'd wind up bullshitting you with an answer and I don't wanna do that. I'm really curious in terms of the movement uh, of drag, drag, drag in general, but when it comes to drag kings, I mean I've seen some shows that are just uh, some I of them mean, are mind blowing. I mean, they they just pop off, you know. Yeah. And I, I feel like, to a certain extent, is it that we look at drag kings as do we hold them in a place that we don't hold? Is it misogyny? You know, ultimately, like, are oh, we, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, absolutely. like, how much does this come down to an issue of misogyny? An issue of, uh, you know, at points we were okay with female impersonators because we were okay with with making fun of women, women, exactly, you know? And then now to have women sort of putting themselves in the position of power, are there power dynamics at play that we're questioning right. because we don't like the idea of questioning where men, you know, the place of men in the right. in society as a whole. And this is me riffing. Yeah. You know, it's just a thought. It's just, uh, here's an, ex I mean, we think a tuck is so fascinating, and we think it's such an art form, and it's oh, how do they do that and everything. But a woman stuffing a, a fake dick down her pants is, it's weird. Yeah, it's sexual. It's what is she doing? You know, that sort of thing. Um, it, it, when it gets, when you get down to the crotch part of drag, <laughs> that's, that's the part, that's part of it right there. It's like, well, the, the tuck is fascinating. There's so much about that, and how is that done? But why is she sticking a dildo down her pants? What's she doing that for, you know? How do women do that? What? <laughs> it's, it's a thing. I know it's a thing, but I think it makes people uncomfortable. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It makes men uncomfortable. Ooh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Lorenzo? No, I, that, I, I agree. I totally agree. And I, I, I guess we need to see more of that so that we c don't feel so you know, bad about it. Right. Horrified when we see that type of thing. Uh, maybe RuPaul sh should start or could start like a RuPaul's you know, king race. Why not? Drag king race. But then why, seg race. why no, uh, segregate it? To start, and then maybe then combine them later. Yeah. Uh, that would be a start. That would be a way to, you know, there, 
they're always doing something different, all-star show and all those variations, so why not start something and then maybe later combine them? Um, it's a start. So it's eight, but do we have time for one more question? Possibly, yeah, maybe one, yeah, in the middle. Um, so afterwards, we'll go into the lobby. Anybody for book signings will, you know, please go outside, stick around, ask us questions. Hi. Hi. Um, so first of all, the book is fabulous. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And probably my favorite chapter is the one on the history of the lip sync. And oh, yes. So fun. And all the ones you choose to discuss are like total classics. I mean, Dita Ritz, Come On, and Latrice Royale, all of them. But I was just wondering if each of you had to pick, what's your all-time favorite lip sync? <laughs> oh, lip sync. Oh, Solid final question. Hmm. It's good. I really do love Data Ritz. I really love that one, partially because uh, Natalie Cole's there, and there's something really emotional about watching Data. I mean, uh, "This Will Be an Everlasting Love" is a nearly impossible song to sing, um, and to. Natalie was so enraptured watching this queen nail the shit out of her song. Right. So that, uh, I mean, they're in the book, to be honest. My, our favorite ones are in the book. It's that and it's Latrice singing Natural Woman. Um, because, and why is L Latrice? Because um, that was a moment of high art. That was a moment of lip syncing as high art where um, Latrice uh, portrayed a, a pregnant woman singing to her unborn child without padding because Latrice is plus size. She didn't have to do a thing. She just had to act it out. And um, the panel cried. Uh, but I've joked about this before. I'm like, I'm pretty sure Rue can cry on cue. But <laughs> um, I got teary-eyed. And part of the reason that's so poignant, and again, you've read it. It's in the chapter. It's that it, it, it demonstrates the end point of about 50 years of drag. Um, because if you go back about 50 years, like to the Pudgy Roberts handbook days, I love Pudgy Roberts. <laughs> um, uh, queens who did um, lip syncs were very much looked down on in the drag community. And uh, if you read accounts of drag uh, lip sync acts back then, very common one was for them to do some song about love or motherhood or something like that as a pregnant woman, like stuffed as a pregnant woman, and then have a baby doll fall out of the bottom of the dress. It was a common drag joke. But there is misogyny underlying that. I don't, I don't want to wag my finger, but there is a little bit of misogyny underlying that. And then you get to Latrice, and he wasn't making fun of anybody. He wasn't, it was so respectful. And it was one of those moments where you're like, oh my God, drag can really be anything. It can say anything in the right hands. So those are my two favorites. Right. Do you no, have another? No, I agree. I totally agree. And That's and why they're in the book. As you said, drag can be anything, and, and it has been a lot, and has yeah. uh, has fought for us, You know, has entertained us, has made us laugh. So that's why we love drag so much. There's always a drag queen doing something, You know, holding a flag, fighting for us, or making us laugh. Having said that, um, Sasha Velour's wig pull made me yeah. cry. Yes. Made me cry. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I was crying. And I remember when it was over, I was like, am I, why am I crying? <laughs> it was such a powerful thing. Um, so and pure art. And pure art. I mean, it's just art. That's it's art. art. Yeah, yeah, it's pure art. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.